Today's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is when Christians remember the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem on the week before he was uh, executed, crucified. And it's called Palm Sunday because people would rip off the palm branches and like they would lay their cloaks down, they would lay down the palm branches. And we read that in Matthew 21. It was a rare occasion where Jesus was being celebrated and actually received that praise to himself. The crowd shouted out in verse 9 of Matthew 21, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. This was a real hero's welcome for Jesus. It was unprecedented because he really steered away from human praise. He often would tell people, hey, don't tell anyone about that miracle. My time's not come yet. Well, it appears his time has come. And this is an outpouring of unprecedented praise for Jesus. But it didn't last long. There were plenty who despised what was going on here. And the praise that was being poured out would have been to them like fingernails down a chalkboard in their ears. They wanted it to stop immediately. They actually wanted him dead. And they got their wish. Jesus knew he was entering this city to be given to a mock trial of people who had already judged him. People who would brutalise him and kill him by the end of the week. By his own volition though, he submitted to the will of the Father to make a legitimate payment for sins he didn't commit. Our sin. And to make a way for us to have eternal life with God. There's no other way. There's no other truth. There's no other life. That's it. Jesus, take it or leave it, is the offer that he makes to us all. You see, but he is the life. And therefore, we can't reject Jesus and expect to receive the life that he, came, that he came to bring. It's an impossible transaction. It just doesn't make logical sense either, does it? I mean, if there's no life apart from him, he gave us life by giving us himself. And so now we find there's two options, two ways to live. We either love him or we hate him. We either are devoted to him or we dismiss him. We savour him as Lord or we sacrifice him on the cross. We obey him or we oppose him. We either revere him or we reject him. But there's two ways to live. Make no mistake about it. And no matter how nicely we want to articulate our position or no matter how benevolently we sort of mould the shape of our life to dismiss Jesus as fictional or fake or irrelevant or just a really nice man, a good moral teacher from history, is to despise him. Some of you say, whoa, 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 that's not what I'm trying to do here. That, Dad, it's like, I'm happy for you to have your religion and you believe what you want to believe, but I don't need that. Like, uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not hateful. Well, the Bible says differently. You see, we're all enemies of God by nature because we are all in sin by nature. And enemies hate each other. Enemies oppose each other. But the Bible says that even while we were enemies, Jesus Christ died for us. He didn't come to die for us because we were really good people and we were making some great progress. And although we really loved God and wanted to do right, we just couldn't. So he didn't just give us a nudge to get us over the line. No, we hated him. By virtue of the fact that we were sinful and rejected his righteous standard. 
Another passage in John 3 tells us that the verdict is that light has come into the world and Jesus is that light. But people love darkness because our deeds are evil. So we run from him. You see, there's no one righteous, Romans tells us. There's not even one who is righteous. We've all fallen short of the glorious standard of God's righteousness. And so now, out of the two ways to live, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim or an atheist, out of the two ways to live, we have all made a meal of it. Really bad choices. We've all rejected God. We've all gravitated to sin. We have become his enemies at one point or another. But our God is love. Our God is humble. Our God forgives. He's gracious. He's, he's paid the unimaginable cost of his very son to draw us to himself in a relationship that's going to last forever. A relationship that will not be broken by death. Death is dealt with. It's done. It's defeated. The sting has been removed. Welcome to Easter. And this coronavirus, what's the worst that can do? Death? <laughs> Didn't you hear? Death has been defeated. There's only one reason that we can have hope. And there's only one reason that we can fear not. And that is because our God is with us. Not because a scientist somewhere in a lab is close to a cure. Although we love those people, we champion those people, we thank God for those people. And it just may be the means by which he blesses this world with healing. But it's in God we trust. And there is our hope. And there is our peace. He's in control. Totally. He's conquered the grave. And he's won salvation when he poured himself out for us. I hope you'll realise this Easter that our God is Jesus Christ and there is no other. He is the King of Kings. However, he's easy to miss. I'll understand that. Because he's a servant king. Now, how many kings in history has there been who are truly servants? Come on. I'm not talking about a king with an affinity to the poor who really relates to the blue collar from their thrones and palaces. No, I'm talking about a king to reject the palace, to step out of it and to identi identify with the pain and the poverty of the lowest in the land. There's no king like Jesus. There's no God like our God. And he's easy to miss when you don't know what you're looking for. When you're looking through the lens of worldly standards, he's easy to miss. Because when we superimpose on him, God, what we think God should look like, man, he's easy to miss. Because he's too slow in moving against evil, isn't he? He has the power, if he has the power that he claims to have, he really doesn't use it wisely, does he? Because he could smite his enemies with one blow of his mighty right hand. But he doesn't, does he? So, really, how could he be God? Well, we need to remember that we were his enemies once. And praise God that he is slow and long-suffering and patient with his enemies. Praise God for God. He sits with fools too, doesn't he? They're his friends. Count me in. And he uses the weak to actually change the world. What kind of God is this? What kind of kingdom is this? Perhaps it's not what we would expect from a sovereign God. But don't walk by and dismiss that man, Jesus. Stop and take a closer look. He will open your eyes. Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find him. 
God just wants to reveal himself to you, but you need to look. So come and look with us this week, next week, the, the weeks after that. Come on a journey in God's word with us as Jesus is revealed for who he is. He's the master of the universe. How do we know that? Well, you know when a friend or a family member or someone says something happens, something unexpected happens and it's like um, either a fluke and they pulled something cool off or like a disaster and they drop stuff and all that fall over and they say to you, I meant that. And you go, there's no way you meant that. No way. It's just a coincidence, right? It was a surprise event. But imagine when someone pulls you aside and says, listen, when so-and-so walks in, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and I'm going to tell you the sequence of events, exactly what's going to happen. And, well, you know, it all unfolds just as they say. We would say, hey, what's going on here, man? How did you do that? We don't deny the power. We just want to know, what kind of power is this? How did you get that? It's just like God. He demonstrates his power in his control of seemingly uncontrollable and spontaneous events. See, he works all circumstances for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's one of his promises for his people in Romans 8.28. It's a beautiful prom promise, but it all relies on his sovereignty to be able to make good on that promise. You see, he promises to, well, he does use the weak and, and the fools of the world to shame the wise and to make the changes. His superiority is demonstrated in his ability to use broken vessels and to keep his word, even when circumstances seem like it would be impossible to do so. I want to look at just one example today of um, something God said through a psalm, through one of his scribes, taking place hundreds of years later in Matthew chapter 21, where Jesus is entering Jerusalem triumphantly on the donkey. First, I want to look at Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is going to inform us about what takes place in Matthew 21. And the main point of Psalm 8 we read is easy to understand, actually, because it's bookended by what the main point is. So let's just read it. Verse 1 says, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. And again, down in verse 9, the last verse, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. That's the point of the psalm. The glory of God, the magnificence of his name, his unrivaled majesty. Now, look in that first verse. You see where it's written Lord in capitals? That's a translation of God's name, Yahweh, which basically means to be. And we, we see his name revealed to Moses back in Exodus where Moses says to God who's sending him on a mission he says hey God who am I going to say sent me on this mission when people ask you know who sent you and God replies in th uh, chapter 3 14 I am who I am you are to say to the Israelites I am has sent me to you this name means God is pre-existent. He just is. He has his being of himself. He's not born. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's the Alpha and the Omega, it says in Revelation, which means just that. God has no dependence on any other. You see, um, the, most, the strongest and the most influential People throughout history have all got to say, by the grace of God, if they don't believe in God, by the grace of my parents or my education or my upbringing or the circumstances, I am who I am today. 
but not God. He himself, within himself, can say, I am who I am. He is eternal. He's unchangeable. He is faithful. He is true to his promises because of that. That's really good news to us who love him and trust him. Our God is. Now, when we understand that the name of our Lord, the first Lord written there in capitals of that verse means God, the second one makes sense. Because if God is Lord, well, then he must be our Lord. Makes sense, right? We must acknowledge him to be ours because the great I am made us. The great I am protects us. The, he takes special care of us. When we realize that, we see that um, the rest of verse 1 in Psalm 8 makes great sense. Lord, Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. We can't look anywhere in this creation where we don't see the magnificence of our God. From childbirth, which is an absolute miracle, to the Amazon rain forest, which is a marvel, from a symphony orchestra to crystal clear waves breaking down at the beach that we miss dearly, by the way. We realise that the artist behind all those things is the Lord and we see his magnificence throughout all creation because his signature is on everything. But even more than that, we read in the second half of verse 1, you have covered the heavens with your majesty. So now not only can we see the magnificence in the world of God, but he has revealed much more brightly his glory to the heavens and the upper heavens. You see, here on earth we live by faith. We have revelations of God. We've had Jesus. We've got the scriptures. But we live by faith and not by sight. Although there's so much to reassure us and so much evidence but those angels and those blessed spirits of people who have gone on who are now in the glory glorious presence of god in the heavens wow they see his glory now look at verse two we're going to see a contrast now from the great i am the eternal lord king of kings the, the great name throughout the earth and up through into the highest heavens. Look at the contrast in verse 2. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. Now that's a contrast. The eternal God and babies. What are the babies doing here? Well... It tells us what they're doing here. They're silencing the enemy of God. But babies are weak and insignificant, aren't they? By human standards, I mean in terms of military figures or political figures or celebrity status. What is a baby? It's helpless. It's weak. If you don't follow it round all day, saving its life, it will die, left to its own devices. It has nothing that it can provide for itself. It relies totally on a guardian. What are they doing in Psalm 8? They are silencing the enemies of God. You see, something's coming out of their mouth. From the mouths of infants and babies, something is coming out of their mouth that God is making so strong that it silences the enemies of God. Now think for a minute. Isn't it remarkable that God has enemies? The preeminent, powerful God who created everything and every being and everything and every being is subject to him has enemies. Now, is that going to be a problem for God? No. That's not a problem for God. All God has to do with his enemies is say, cease to exist. 
and they do. But instead of just squashing his enemies, instead of flicking them with his mighty right hand, he takes the smallest and the weakest and the most insignificant people, babies, in this world, and he uses them as a means of victory. Now that's power. There's a contrast between God and babies and now a contrast between God and humans in general as we read on. It says, When I observed the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you set in place. Now stop there and think about the heavens, the moons and the stars. And we, we know a lot more about these things these days with the telescopes and the documentaries we've got access to those magnificent dimensions and explosions and the powers are quite frightening the psalmist here says that they were set by the fingers of God that's just finger work the vast ferocious powers of the universe were set with finger work of a God what kind of God is that what kind of dimensions and power and majesty does a God have like that? Incomprehensible. And yet within that power, we read on verse 4 to 6. Listen what he does with that power that he created with his fingers. He remembers humans. What are humans that you remember us? A son of man that you look after him. You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the work of your hands. You put everything under his feet. So this amazing God with power and majesty, our God values and cherishes us, his people created in his image. And he charges us with the ruling of his creation. It's amazing. So he takes the weak of this world and conquers enemies, and he takes humans which are as dust and has them rule over his creation. He doesn't look like we would expect him to look. He doesn't wield his power like we expect him to wield his power. He doesn't function like the world's kingdom functions. His kingdom's different. His power is made perfect in weakness, our weakness. So now back to Jerusalem. We see his son, the God who created all things, riding on the back of a donkey, coming into Jerusalem hundreds of years after that psalm was written. And thousands upon thousands of people, throngs of people, shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! In the highest. The city was heaving. Many people in uproar. Crowds were saying, who is this guy, man? Who is this? Some say he's a prophet from God. Some are saying, no, he's a blasphemer, man. He's better, better watch himself. And others are saying, he is the very Messiah. He enters the temple and he turns it upside down in accordance with a prophecy made by a God who has the power to fulfill it. He drives out those selling doves and he upturns the tables of the money changers for corrupt dealings and turning his house, his father's house, into a den of thieves. And the blind then come to Jesus and they the lame come to Jesus and he heals them. And the children, having heard their parents, having seen the crowds, are all shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David! The chief priests and the scribes, which are the enemies of God, upon hearing the children, become indignant and they say to Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? And he says, yes. He doesn't stop them. This time, he's receiving the praise. 
and he says, have you not read? You have prepared praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. Referring to Psalm 8. Now back in Psalm 8, something was coming out of the mouths of the weak infants and babies that God was using as a stronghold to silence enemies and adversaries. And here we hear what is coming out of their mouths. Praise. The power of God that he chooses to still his enemies is in the praise coming out of the mouths of his people, even through their weakness. So let's not stop praising our God, the promise-keeping God, the one true God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the way, the truth, and the life, the only hope we have. Let's continue to praise Him, for in the praise there is strength to bring down the enemies of God. And in our weakness, His power is made perfect. So fear not, our God is with us. Let's pray. Dear Father, what more can we say than Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hallelujah, all glory to God, the King, our God, Jesus, the one who rides on a donkey to a cross to pour out his life for sins he didn't commit, our sins, to give us a life and a freedom that we don't deserve and we can't lose because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Father, for that hope. It's a living hope and in a time like this, it brings real peace. Oh, thank you for that peace. Lord, it's a great day. It's a great week and we've got you. We've got you and that's all that counts. Praise you. Thank you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. We've got God and we've got each other. Connect with us online. Connect with us with the Zoom fellowship meetings that we're having on Sunday at 10.30 straight after this service and throughout the week in home groups. If you're struggling with the connection, whether it's um, who to connect with or how to connect with them, please call us. Call us at the church. We want to walk with you through that. And uh, bless you. Happy Easter week. We'll see you Friday for Good Friday. Till then, bless you. Take care. See ya.